In my opinion, portrait painting is more than just the accurate representation of what someone looks like. Portrait painting is about describing the character and personality of an individual. And one of the best ways to learn how to describe character and personality in a painting is to learn how to paint from life. And that is what I believe to be the secret of portraiture. And as a bonus to this week's episode, at the end of the demonstration, there will be an exclusive conversation about the topic of variation in the pose featuring the artist, Karen Warshall. Getting started with the demonstration here, you're going to be seeing individual segments of the model in real time and painting footage in real time. Now in the beginning of the filming, I did have the camera placed in not the best location as I am painting in a painting group. So my focus was not too much on the camera angle, but don't worry, the camera angle will improve very very soon in the painting footage so as you're seeing here the block in is executed with just very simple straight lines and angles to simplify the complexity of the forms that we're seeing observing from nature and since i'm working with a painting group um, i have to kind of keep the camera a little bit close to me so the camera is kind of right next to my face in this shot but now you should be able to see uh, the footage much better and mind you the um, the lighting here is natural light so it's going to appear a little bit cooler throughout the footage uh, but that would actually that will actually help you see these color combinations with a little bit more clarity so as you're seeing me mix up the color value web remember that the color value web is just a um, an organization of flesh tones with the lightest on the top and then working our way towards the bottom towards the darker flesh tones uh, so I'm, let me list out the colors for you as I'm mixing the color value web so I have titanium white flake white burnt umber alizarin permanent cadmium red yellow ochre sap green ultramarine blue and ivory black and as I recall with the flesh tones since I'm working from life I have a much greater advantage with color um, so if you would like to have the photo reference for this painting though this is much more about working from life I will also have a photo reference that I took while I was here and link it into the description box down below well I'll link my Facebook uh, photo reference group so you can um, have the photo reference for yourself to follow along in this painting demonstration but now the flesh tones are a little orangey they're a little bit of a kind of a gray yellow orangey tone so in the lighter middle tones i used a combination of the uh, cadmium red and the yellow ochre to create a kind of a muted orange muted meaning not as saturated and then i combined the flake white and burnt umber just to cool down so i used the burnt umber just to cool down uh, some of the uh, the heat from combining uh, especially the cadmium red uh, the combination of the cadmium red and the yellow ochre so just basically those simple three colors and as i work my way further down um, I actually use more of the flake white and burnt umber and then a little bit of the sap green and um, a lizard and permanent lives right around the darker middle tone region of the palette right around there where you're seeing me mix and my strategy for this painting demonstration um, the purpose really is to get as much done as I possibly can uh, in the most efficient way that I possibly can. Now, as I said, I'm challenging you to work from life. Complete a painting entirely from life. This will be a challenge, okay? The hashtag, you want to hashtag all from life. So hashtag all from life challenge. Again, hashtag all from life challenge. So on your social medias, on your Instagram, your Facebook, uh, on, on whichever social medias I challenge you to create a painting entirely from life and in the tags put hashtag all from life challenge 
And it's not to say that there's anything wrong with working from photo reference. And in fact, I'm going to reiterate this throughout uh, the painting footage. There's nothing wrong with working from photo reference. I think that there should be a balance uh, between working from life and working from photo reference. So I wouldn't recommend working strictly from photo reference, though it, it's, it's okay if you want to work strictly from life. Of course, the old masters, you know, uh, Sargent, Titian, um, you know, Rembrandt, Caravaggio didn't have photo references to work with. So what they uh, had to do was to do pretty much a bunch of different studies from life and then combine those studies along with work from the live model to produce their finished works. And as far as the painting approach is concerned, I am working on a much smaller canvas. This is an 8 by 10 inch cotton canvas. It has been pre-toned with neutral gray acrylic paint. And what I'm doing is I'm starting off with a smaller brush. So this is kind of a hybrid of the large plain stage and the small plain stage. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm pretty much going right for the true value and the true color that I want right away in each individual area. So I'm working one area at a time and I'm considering the shape of the form of which I'm applying these colors and values and each plane change is indicated by a value change so as you're seeing here in the close-up there are now several values within this one shape of the eye socket of the eye as you're seeing here when it goes lighter as you're seeing there it's because these areas are facing the light a little bit more when it gets darker it's because the uh, planes are facing the light a little bit less and when you're working from life it's very important to take note of the position that the model is making relative to you. So variation in the pose is going to be a topic that I'm actually going to talk about with Karen Warshaw, one of the uh, one of my most favorite classical artists living today. In fact, I was painting in her studio along with a couple other artists the day that this was filmed. So. The topic of variation in the pose is always asked. It's one of the most common questions I get whenever I mention that I'm painting from a live model. So I'm going to reserve the conversation, or I'm going to reserve most of the conversation or dialogue about variation in the pose uh, till the end of this video. And you're actually going to see a, a bonus conversation between uh, my opinions and my ideas on variation in the pose and Karen's. Uh, opinion on the variation of the pose and how to utilize it. Another important thing to think about when you're creating a portrait from life, whether you use this technique or you use other techniques, the important thing to think about is the anatomy and the anatomy with respect to the planes because we can see with much more clarity when we're working from life. So as you see with the eye sockets, there are specific shapes beneath the eye socket and through the corner of the eye socket as I start to develop with even more precision the concavity of the eye socket and the side plane right there of the maxilla. So important anatomical considerations are now being put into play with the application of specific planes and values. And always remember that I tend to emphasize the main triangle. So the main triangle is just the two eyes and the nose. And I emphasize the main triangle throughout most of uh, my drawings and paintings when it comes to portrait paintings. In particular, just because an eye, in my opinion, is just more difficult to move than the nose. The nose is more difficult to move than the mouth. And the chin and the ear and the hairline again is uh, not as difficult to move as the mouth so you can kind of see the order of importance and why I start off with the eyes and the nose just because later on in the painting I don't want to spend so much time uh, you know rendering out the forehead just to find out that the eye has to move or I don't want to spend too much time rendering out the mouth just to find out that the nose has to move or something like that.
And you're seeing how I'm working one plane at a time. The lighter colors have mostly the titanium white and the middle colors have mostly flake white relative to the color combination. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the highlights have mostly titanium white alone. I'm saying that when I use a white color mixed in with flesh tones, in the brighter lights, I'm using more titanium white. And in the middle tones, I'm using more flake white. So if you're curious as to why I have two whites on the palette, flake white has this property, as you're seeing here, of which it allows me to use more of it without raising the value too much. Now, what I meant by you're actually seeing it in use is that this half tone that I'm putting beneath the bottom plane of the bulb of the nose has a little bit of white mixed into that yellow ochre, cadmium red, burnt umber-ish hue. The benefit is that when I want to raise the value, as you just saw in the previous shot right there, that plane right there is a lighter light, and it does have the, the usual yellow ochre, cadmium red, influence but it has the titanium white now you're seeing the difference between how i can uh, essentially carve out a plane with titanium white and how i can carve out a plane using the flake white now not only do you want to consider the value and the color of a specific shape, but you also want to consider now the edge quality between given shapes. So you can think of shapes that are physically sharper or planes that are physically sharper, such as the side plane of the nose. It, the wing of the nose right here, this area has a much faster curve so the curvature is much greater in that area so the planes are actually going to gradate in terms of their uh, relative lightness or darkness the gradation is going to be much greater than if you were considering the top plane or the top area of the upper eyelid meaning that the transition of values is going to be much more extreme in areas such as the uh, the wing of the nose or the lower eyelid or the even the side of the nose the areas that are more curvy are just going to have a faster transition of value and when we get into uh, the lighter lights on the cheekbone you'll actually see that those gradations are much more subtle because that curve will be a slower curve. So as we're working our way with the flesh tones, now I have to consider the fact that I am working from the live model as you're seeing some of the uh, footage of the live model in conjunction with the painting footage. The important thing to take note is that when you're working from life, you have a much greater advantage when it comes to color relationships. Now, you can't really gauge color relationships as accurately from a photo reference. Not always the case, but usually that's the case. So let me define color relationships and how I use them in terms of portraiture. Now, there are two ways you can think about... Uh, I'm going to just introduce two ways you can think about uh, relating colors. You can relate colors based on their temperature, and you can relate colors based on their hue. Now, there can be some kind of in-between relations, and we'll get to those later on. Now, you can say that the nose, or say the wing of the nose, when you're working from life, appears warmer than the uh, maxilla region of the face, meaning the side plane of the face. Now you can make that comparison via temperature, but then that can become a little bit confusing when you say, well, the lower eyelid uh, looks a little bit warmer than the maxilla too. So now you have to compare the hues. So the hue of the wing of the nose appears a little bit more towards the pinkish hue relative to the maxilla and the lower eyelid 
appears a little closer to a kind of, um, I want to say, a, a orangey red color. Now, of course, that's pushing it. I'm pushing the color, of course, but you can see that you can compare different hues uh, between planes of color. And the highlight there is actually very cool. It's a cool highlight. So cool, now I'm speaking of in terms of temperature, but I can also relate it to the highlight on the side of the eye. It appears now, I'd say, a little more blue than the highlight across from the eye to the right of the screen, that lighter area. So the hue appears a little closer to the bluish uh, as opposed to the kind of pinkish light that you're seeing for the highlight uh, closer to the eye on the right of the screen. And the way that I achieve that kind of cool bluish type of highlight without using ultramarine blue or any of the blues is to just use titanium white mostly titanium white with a little influence of the flesh tone. Titanium white on its own is actually a very cool and temperature type of color. And now in terms of the advantage of working from life uh, rather than photo reference, uh, one of the other advantages is in trying to capture the personality of the model. And that can also be obtained, believe it or not, through variations or changes in the pose. As I mentioned earlier, stay tuned for the later portion of this episode. In the end of this episode, right before the new patron shoutouts, I'm going to have a conversation between the artist Karen Warshaw and me. So Karen is actually going to offer some brilliant input into how you can further describe the personality that a model has from working from life as opposed to the constraints of solely working from photo reference. Now again, with the tiny brush that I'm using, I'm purposefully trying my best with each shape to basically nail the color right away. So I am working much faster than I normally would if I were uh, filming the regular type of video, you know, painting from the photo reference. Uh, mind you, each plane that I'm putting in there, as you're seeing, this is much closer to that of uh, graphite drawing, drawing with a very sharp pencil, as opposed to uh, the more mass approach, where you're going in with large values when you're working in charcoal. And if you can fine-tune your precision between relating shapes to one another, you can get away with this kind of thing. And I say get away just because, again, this is kind of a taboo way of working for many oil painters. Many oil painters will prefer the, the type of method where you work with large uh, masses of color and then kind of sculpt out the forms that way, uh, working more general to specific instead of going uh, more specific right away. And again, you've seen me work that way before. Again, this channel is about, uh, you know, practicing and learning as many different techniques as possible. Uh, so again, this is a new type of approach that you're seeing me do with that little teeny tiny brush. You haven't seen me paint this way before. And again, just to try and get the um, you know, the forms to read as quickly as possible. Now, had I more time to work with the model, sure, I probably would, uh, you know, not be working as fast. But that's another one of the, uh, I think, benefits of working from life. It kind of keeps you on your toes because time is money, especially when you're working from life because, hey, we're paying a model to sit there for us. So we better paint the best that we can, especially when time is money and we're really trying to do the most that we can in that given interval of time. And one thing that I want you to take note of right now is how organized the color value web is on my palette. The color value web, see how organized it is. It almost looks like, it, it almost looks fake. It almost looks like it's not even the mixing space. 
as you see, it is my mixing space, and that's just how focused I was in this stage of the painting. And especially uh, given the fact that I'm using that tiny, tiny brush, and now in terms of paint handling, there is a little bit of the odorless mineral spirits and um, just a tiny bit of odorless mineral spirits that goes into cleaning the brush in between transitions from uh, gi given colors, but not very much. I'm trying to keep it pretty much just straight paint for as long as possible. And when I was here, I actually forgot my container of my Neo McGilt Medium, so I actually didn't end up using Neo McGilt Medium, not because I didn't want to, just because I forgot the container. Now this topic of painting from life, creating a painting entirely from life, um, it's not that unique really. A lot of painters that I know strictly only work from life and only use photo references when they absolutely need to. Now I use photo reference, I want to say uh, a lot, just because the time constraints when it comes to working with the live model. And I think this is going to be a very interesting kind of experiment. So remember earlier I mentioned that this will be a challenge. So hashtag all from life challenge. So I want you to type in hashtag all from life challenge and challenge your friends, challenge other art YouTubers that you know of uh, or, or follow and see if they would be interested in doing this very same uh, challenge as well. Now, of course, if you only work from life and the, um, the YouTuber or Instagram artist or artist that is on Instagram or whoever you want to challenge already completely works from life, then of course it's not much of a challenge. But what I want is to, you know, just get to enjoy the experience and the immediacy of what it's like to create a painting entirely from life. Now as you're seeing, I'm starting to uh, raise the warmth. So um, notice I'm using a color relationship uh, via the temperature now, the warmth of the um, the side of the orbiculars oris, the side of the uh, the shape containing the mouth, is a little warmer, and then as it goes closer to the mouth, there's actually going to be a kind of more cool greenish type of uh, flesh tone. And now with the darkest accent, you're seeing me start to place in um, the corner of the, uh, the the shape where the upper lip meets the side of the teeth and then blocks out the light. So I, I am going to paint a little bit of the teeth. And it just so happens that the, um, you know, the model, the way she was sitting over time, that was just her expression. And, um, you know, when you're working from life, it's a, it's like a continuous combination of individual events or individual moments. And again, I'm not going to talk too much about that because that is going to be the topic in the short video that you're going to see at the uh, end of this one. But again, that's just kind of the expression that the model had. And now as I start to work my way up with the... Um, that warmer color, we're going to start to put in the top plane of the upper lip. Now, let's talk a little bit about the compression of the colors that you see when you're working in natural light. Again, this is a natural lit pose, so meaning there is a north light that's just, uh, you know, providing a very cool and uh, beautifully flat arrangement of colors okay and you're really going to see that with the mouth now that we're starting to put in um, you know more of a warmish color had this been 
um, electric lighting, as you've seen with my um, other demonstrations where, you know, a LED light or some type of fluorescent light was used to light the model. Uh, those create much sharper reds, in particular around the lips with certain models, and it also creates more drama between the, um, you know, the light and shadow regions of the face. Now, when you're working in natural light, I will say that natural light is a little more difficult, especially to a, uh, you know, someone that doesn't have as much experience. So if you don't have as much experience with painting, then I would suggest using electric light. But of course, you can always practice between different lighting scenarios. Now, as you're seeing how I'm start to build uh, the kind of pinkish color for the lower lip, I'm painting it right alongside the color value web. So I tend to call this a rail. So a rail is just another color value web alongside the main color value web that has a specific hue change. So this specific hue change is more pink. And as I mentioned, the colors are a little bit more flat. So meaning that there's not too much variation between individual shapes of color, but rather they're kind of closer to one another and the variation of tone between them is much more subtle. And now I'm gonna allow a little bit of audio silence as I start to paint in some of these planes for the lower lip, as it is for the most part, uh, kind of repetitive, so I'm just going from one plane to another plane. So I'm pretty sure you don't want to hear me uh, narrate for, you know, the entire footage. So let me just allow a little bit of audio silence. Now in the audio silence, I will narrate a little bit once in a while, um, just so that you know it's not dead silent for too long of a period of time. So we're still in a little bit of audio silence, but what I'm doing now is starting to put in the plane uh, for the uh, division between the bottom of the lower lip, and now we're starting to put in the division between the um, lower lip and the teeth and the teeth I'm actually going to leave rather cool uh, so almost just the color of the tone of the canvas and now you're seeing uh, I'm starting to put in the uh, a little bit of a half tone for the teeth so I actually did use a little bit of a cooler color and in between the transition from the warm color of the lips into this cooler color that you're seeing here I did clean off the brush with the odorless mineral spirits And now you're seeing I'm starting to put in the pathway planes, meaning the planes that connect 
the sides or the corners of the mouth into the side of the orbicularis oris, the structure, the anatomical structure of which uh, contains the mouth. All right, so now we're going to return to the regular narration. Now remember, the strategy was to get the most difficult things first, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and then the planes surrounding those features. And now we're going to have much more freedom to move around the shapes as we approach the, uh, there you have the bottom of the orbiculars oris with our model here. So. That plane has also uh, a little bit of this sap green, so there's a little bit of a hue change as well. Uh, the bottom plane under here is much cooler, kind of reminiscent of the natural light. And you tend to see more of the kind of coolish half tones, especially when you're working with natural light. And there we're just building one plane at a time, working our way up towards the um, the corner of the mouth. Now I probably wouldn't have used this same brush if I were working on a larger painting. So um, if you're going to go at it one shape at a time like this, you really want to use that one brush that is uh, kind of manageable with the size of your canvas. If this was a larger canvas, if this was an 11 by 14 inch canvas, or larger, then I would probably go with a larger round brush to go in with the forms. And yes, I said round brush. Uh, I usually use filberts and flats, but for this approach, for this tactic, I chose to go with a round brush just to kind of have more of the feeling of working uh, with a sharpened pencil. So that is to make this feel closer and closer to working uh, with graphite as opposed to the typical kind of you know large planar way of working with charcoal and of course that's not to say that I'm using graphite or charcoal I'm just making an analogy between uh, drawing and painting by saying that Now you're seeing we're start to we're starting to move up in the value range on the side of the uh, the top plane of the chin, and there I'm starting to make it a little bit um, not as bright, but still kind of a lighter half tone. Uh, that's just one step cooler, or sorry, one step um, darker than the lightest light. Now I'm working down in the value range, so now we're going down. Uh, with the values only really cleaning off the brush so when the brush is off camera that's most likely when I'm going to be cleaning off the brush now you're seeing that I'm using the sap green so did you see that transition from the uh, the warmer color to the cooler color as I used the sap green again I, I really want to clean off the brush when I'm transitioning especially from a red to a green so now as we work our way towards the side of the chin, uh, towards the mandible, the hues are going to get a little bit closer to the greenish. The temperature is going to be cooler, and these planes are going to be um, you know, more and more prominent as we work our way across the forms. And especially with the uh, bottom plane of the chin, 
you see, you can see how clearly uh, carved basically that uh, the chin is. So between one plane and the other plane, and there you saw, right there, I went in with an in-between plane. So it may look like I was, um, you know, it may look like I'm blending uh, to achieve you know, soft transitions, but with this tiny brush, it gives me so much control that I'm able to go in, uh, you know, one plane division at a time, uh, where if you look closely at the painting, it may look like the edges are kind of sharp, but from far away, the edges will seem to kind of just, uh, you know, mesh into one another. And even in the class that I teach, uh, the class is titled Fundamentals of Portrait Painting, Painting from Life. So even the uh, instructed class that I teach, again, links in the description box down below if you're interested in uh, painting with me or taking a class with me. So even the classes that I teach, uh, we work completely from life. So again, just to show you just how much emphasis I have in um, training one to work from the live model. So you saw just before that clip, I actually did draw another outline on the corner of the chin. I actually did have to move the chin up a little bit. Remember I said that if I had to move something, I would rather it be the hairline or the chin, and that's exactly what happened. I had to move the chin up. Now, as you saw, um, we are using different brushes now. So I'm using larger brushes just to move across the planes for the side of the cheekbone and the uh, forehead much faster. So uh, the tactic changed for the forehead and the side of the face and the ear. I went with larger brushes just because I knew I wasn't really going to spend as much time rendering out those areas. As you just saw, I mixed up the titanium white, the burnt umber, and the ivory black to obtain the shape for the hair. The hair is a kind of coolish color, but it's not straight blue and it's not completely gray either. So there's a little bit of influence from the uh, burnt umber and even a little bit of influence from the alizarin permanent. And when you're painting hair, whether it be from life or from photo reference, you really want to think about it as plain. So there you see a lighter plane for the hair. Now you're seeing we're going to start to add more light planes for the corner of the hair. And it also depends on what brush you're using as well. You can achieve specific brush strokes with specific types of brushes. Um, that brush that I'm using is nothing special. It's a pretty worn out round brush, but it does add a specific type of brush stroke that I like. So oftentimes you can suggest individual strands of hair based on the application of the brush stroke. So what I want is for the brush stroke to suggest the individual strands of hair. Now you're seeing me paint in those shapes and now we're just going to paint in with a little bit of a thinner application of paint. We have painted in um, the dark fabric for the scarf that the model is wearing and now we're going wet on wet painting in a wet layer of a, basically a pinkish color on top of that area um, letting the brush strokes kind of be a little soft letting it uh, you know blend into the uh, kind of more violet color that we painted in earlier Now since you, you've seen that skeleton, I, I kind of have to talk about the skeleton for a second here. Uh, just use titanium white and cadmium red. The reason you're seeing the skeleton in the corner of the footage, I should have mentioned this before. Again, we're working in an artist's studio, another artist's studio, and that skeleton is a very valuable anatomical teaching tool. So now what we're going to do is just go in with the background color. The background is just sap green yellow ochre and a little bit of the burnt umber and a little bit of ivory black. Now the background is completely covered. Let's get you in a close-up shot here so you can see the um, 
application of this pinkish color for the jewelry. And with jewelry, you really want to keep it very simple, although you can make it as complex as you like. But in general, uh, I just think that it's a nice touch, an aesthetic touch, when you just leave a few highlights. There you go. Just a few simple little highlights and a light and shadow shape. And then you'll see how well the jewelry can read from a distance without having too much detail. And now we're going to get you into one last little close-up here so you can see how I uh, kind of change the hue a little bit for the cast shadow underneath the nose. Remember the cast shadow is a shadow that is projected when light hits one thing and projects a shadow. And after this clip, uh, very shortly now, just in a couple minutes, you're going to see that segment, uh, the dialogue between Karen Warshall and me as we are talking about the um, the topic of variation in the pose. Remember that when you're working from life, a model's head can move, uh, the pose can have some variation, and that's one of the more difficult aspects when it comes to working from life. And we actually did just push the hue variation a little bit on the bottom of the nose. I did add a little more uh, warmth uh, with a little bit of the uh, cadmium red and yellow ochre towards the bottom of the nose. Now, remember, if you would like to have a photo reference of our model, I'm going to have the photo reference posted in the photo reference Facebook group, though remember, that this painting was created entirely from life. And remember, put in that hashtag all from life challenge on your social medias uh, for when you create a painting completely from life. And feel free to challenge other uh, YouTube creators or other artists to do this challenge as well. I would really, really love to see uh, you know, other artists creating portraits or landscapes, still lives, or, or whatever, working entirely from life. And there you have it, an original 8 by 10 inch oil painting created entirely working from life. If you are interested in purchasing this oil painting and or other paintings that I have created, I'll have a link to my Etsy store in the description box down below. If you would like to support this channel even more, I have a Patreon account listed in the description box down below where I offer things such as live painting demonstrations, live stream painting demonstrations. Now, without further ado, let's get into the conversation about variation in the pose. Well, hello there and welcome to a bonus section of this episode. I have Karen Warshaw with me here. She is an amazing artist. She's been doing classical art for 30 years now. She currently teaches at MICA, that is Maryland Institute College of Art. She even has a group that she takes over to Italy, which is pretty interesting and awesome. Here are some images of her artwork. So as you can see, she's very classically trained. She's exceptionally talented at drawing, and in particular, a classical style to drawing that you don't really see too much in modern day artwork. Remember, there's nothing wrong in working from photo references like I've been saying throughout this episode. It's just that you get that certain extra when you're working from life. And again, beautiful, beautiful artwork. And let's introduce the question of variation in the pose. One of the questions that you're going to ask me, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to get in the comments of this week's episode in particular, is how to deal with variation in the pose and sometimes how to utilize variation in the pose. So let's hear from her own words on how she deals with the subject of variation in the pose. So variation in the pose is, I think, the main, once, once you know how to draw, obviously learning how to draw is the most important sort of basis for doing portraits, but after that, variation in the pose becomes the biggest challenge in drawing a portrait from life because you're drawing a live person and you want to you want to capture the the personality of your sitter you want to capture the personality of that live person so while you want them to hold still when somebody holds stone still without moving oftentimes you don't get personality so you have to be able to um, 
know what you're looking at even if your model moves and it's it's really tricky because so variation in the pose if you're not conscious of what's going on is the biggest problem i teach portraiture i've been teaching portraiture for 20 years portrait drawing and it's the biggest problem that students have it's what i call multiple position syndrome i say oh well you're suffering from multiple position syndrome look you have the eye in one position on this side and the eye is in another position on the other side because they're not conscious they're just kind of blindly copying so that's the number one rule you don't blindly copy what's in front of you you have to pay attention to the position so variation in the pose can kill a portrait if you're not conscious of it but if you're conscious and you you know for instance that your model let's say is in a little bit of a three quarters like this and you're able to see a shift in whatever direction you have a lot of choices in how to deal with that so you can number one ask the model to get back in the position that they were in before and most models can do that but sometimes a model will shift in such a way not so much turning because if they're turned you're always best off to get them back in the right turn if you're having trouble getting them in the right turn or if you're working in a room with a lot of other people and everybody's not in agreement you can move over for, for the for the face you know but also you have to be able to combine the different parts into a greater whole in order to get an expression so if we look at so if we look at this painting now this isn't so much a, a turn she was pretty good at holding the turn she was pretty good at holding this pose but because she's an artist herself she kind of understands the importance of it but as far as her expression goes i watched to see her expression change so it wasn't so much a position change but it was a change of the elements of the face and i watched to see when it changed and i started to pull her mouth up i started to pull her cheeks up i would i would tell her a joke and she would break into a huge smile well i couldn't paint her with that huge smile but i would have to watch and wait until it would subside a little bit and it was a constant kind of in, in a way collaboration between me and Elena to get to get that position I mean to get that expression so it, it wasn't so much that her position was changing all the time she was quite good at holding her position actually but in any case changes in the model whether it's their expression whether it's their position can be used to an advantage if you're conscious of what position you're drawing. Sometimes, for instance, I'll start a painting and the model will be maybe just slightly turned. And then as, as we progress, now, not in like the fourth sitting, but during the first sitting, or maybe even the second sitting, the model will turn a little more and I'll see I like it better. So that change helps me to make a new decision and I can adjust things and make that work. So. I find that as long as I'm conscious of what exactly is happening in my painting, where the center line is, and how everything to the side of each center line is, everything to each side of the center is relating to that center, then I'm able to sort of move my portrait as a whole, my figure as well. I'm able to move it as a whole to get the best result. Yeah, and, and the way I think of it is a collect, it's like a collection of moments. When you're working from life, like a, a series of events that all takes place in time, but then you kind of put it into one canvas, and that canvas represents that collection of individual experiences. That's what I, I think about when I work from life, and in particular, variation in the pose. Sometimes I'll look for the change, like if the head tilts a little bit. I'll, sometimes I'll chase it if I like the way it looks. If I like the way that it looks, then it adds to the painting for me. Or if I don't like the way that the change happens, then I usually I'll like I'll close one eye and then try to turn around and like position the model's head back in the exact same place. And usually when I start a pose, I kind of tell myself what the action is, kind of like a verb. I, I tell myself the model's head is turned three quarters, a little bit closer to profile or something like that, and turned. And then I use that to reset the pose. Yeah. Well, what you said reminds me of something that I wrote a while ago in one of my artist statements. I'll read it. It says. Um, there's nothing like watching a person's personality unfold on his or her face as you paint them. If a snapshot captures a moment in time, the artist working from life has the opportunity to observe and document the inner person as it manifests itself over time. And I think that that's what portraiture is about. I mean, I think portraiture is about 
capturing the inner person, getting their inner self to come out. And you don't know what somebody looks like from just one snapshot. We have ideas about what people look like based on the, the better we know somebody, the more complex our image of what they look like is. Because we've seen them look so many different ways as their personality comes out on their face. I think it's that's sort of the crux of portraiture. And there you have it, the question of variation in the pose from Karen Warshall. Remember, I'm gonna have links to her Instagram in the description box down below, her artist website where you can see um, her amazing artwork. And remember that she taught me so much throughout the years in how to approach painting, in particular classical painting. So a lot of the stuff that I said to you in my previous tutorials, a lot of that stuff is what I learned from Karen Warshall along with Paul and Hamilton and my other teachers that I talked about before. So remember, if you have a question that you would like answered in the, the type of format that we just did for Karen, I'm gonna actually be back in her studio the next week. So go ahead and type in the uh, questions or in the comments down below type of question. Now you're only going to have two days to do this, okay, because this goes up Saturday. So you have Saturday and Sunday and then I'm back here on Monday. So early bird gets the worm basically. So if you have any questions that you want Karen to answer, we can call this Ask Karen. So if you have any questions you want her to answer, just go ahead and type it down in the comment section down below. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I wish you the best in all of your artwork and I'll see you on the next episode. And it's now time for our new patron shout out. So this is a very special shout out to Devon Harbolt, Carrie Jones, Kathy, and Dorothy Knuckles. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced anyone's name. Thank you so much for your support. Your support means the world to me. With your support, I will be able to continue developing these videos and continue improving on the production of these videos. Again, thank you so much. I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next episode.